Hi everyone! In the last few videos, we've explored how to optimize Terrigen's render settings in order to render an image sequence at the desired quality in as short a time period as possible. After the render process is complete, it's very common in a visual effects production pipeline to pass these rendered images onto the compositing department, where they can be fine-tuned and adjusted, or used as elements in a much larger shot. In order to make these adjustments, the beauty paths or final render might need to be separated into individual components, such as the terrain or cloud layers. Special sequences containing the buffers or non-visual data like motion vectors and z-depth information may also be needed, and sometimes matte passes are required in order to isolate a specific region of the image sequence for further manipulation. Instead of having to create a separate scene for each of these circumstances, Terrigen 4 Professional gives us the ability to create render layers, which allows us to select the render elements we want to save in addition to the final render. Let's get started by adding a render layer to our project. In the Render Settings, right-click on the green plus button to the right of the Render Layer parameter and select Create New Render Layer. Then, click on the green plus button again and select Go to Render Layer 02 to open up the settings for the Render Layer. Under the Objects tab, you have the ability to assign object groups and set the render state for the individual items they contain. In our project, we don't want the three aircraft objects to render in the final image. So let's group them together, and then assign that group to the Object Group 1 parameter, where we'll be able to define their group visibility. Click on the Stay Open button at the top of the Settings window to keep this window open while we return to the Node Network. In the Node Network, select the three aircraft objects, and then press Ctrl-G on your keyboard to group them together. Move the newly created group to an empty area of the Node Network making sure that all three aircraft nodes are in the group. Then double-click on the group's title bar to open its settings window. Give the group a descriptive name like Aircraft Objects, then close the window. Notice that a new bookmark has appeared on the left side of the Node Network view. Back on the Render Layer window, click on the green plus button to the right of the Object Group 1 parameter and assign the new Aircraft Objects group. Now. Click on the Render drop-down directly beneath the Object Group 1 parameter. This is where you instruct Terrigen how to render this object group, or in other words, its visibility. The object group can be rendered as visible or invisible, or as a holdout. When holdout is selected, the objects in the group are rendered as black shapes with an alpha value of 0. Items in front of these objects will be visible, but anything behind the holdout objects will be occluded or blocked from view. We want the three aircraft objects to be invisible in our rendered image, so choose that entry from the list. It's important to note that some objects have their own set of visibility parameters, separate from render layers, like the three aircraft objects, which are imported 3D objects in OBJ format. When an object with its own set of visibility parameters is included in a render layer object group, Terrigen uses a set of rules to combine the two visibility settings. The setting that is considered to be the least visible will be used for that object. For example, if the render layer's object group was set to holdout and one of the three aircraft objects had its own visibility parameter set to invisible, then that aircraft would be invisible in the rendered image because the invisible setting is considered the least visible of the two settings. In the written documentation for render layers, there is a table showing all the possible combinations. To the right of the Render Visibility parameter is the Cast Shadows and Other Rays checkbox, which instructs Terrigen whether to include or exclude this object group from being able to cast shadows on other objects or themselves, and be visible to other rays, so that they show up as reflections, or through transparent surfaces, or affect global illumination. Object groups set to Invisible or Holdout mode can still cast shadows and be visible to other rays, and conversely, Object groups set to visible mode can have their shadows disabled and made invisible to other rays. Just as with the render visibility parameter, some objects have their own parameters to enable or disable shadow casting and visibility to other rays. When the cast shadows and other rays checkbox is enabled for the object group, then the individual object settings will be used. But when the cast shadows and other rays checkbox is disabled for the object group, then the individual objects will not cast shadow or be seen by other rays. You can have up to five object groups per render layer, 
and all other items in the project that are not assigned to an object group will fall under the All Objects category at the bottom of the dialog window. They also have a Render Visibility mode and Cast Shadows and Other Rays checkbox that apply to them. So be sure to check these settings after establishing the first object group in the project. Under the Lights tab, you can set up to five light groups to illuminate your rendered image. You create a group of lights in the same way as you create a group of objects, by selecting the lights in the node network and grouping them together by pressing Ctrl G on your keyboard. Move the group to an empty area of the node network. Then double click on the group's title bar and give it a descriptive name like Daylight. A bookmark will appear on the left side of the node network as well. Once the group has been created, you can assign it to one of the empty parameters on the Lights tab. There are a few rules to be aware of when using light groups. The first is that if any light groups are assigned and exist in the project, only the lights in those groups will affect the rendered image. This means that if any lights in the project do not belong to one of the assigned light groups, then they will be ignored during the render process. The second rule is that if an individual light in the project is disabled, it will remain disabled, regardless of its membership in a light group. Light groups treat Enviro lights the same as other lights, which means that if the Enviro light is not in one of the active light groups, then global illumination will not be rendered. However, sometimes you may want the Enviro light to be available to all light groups, and therefore not included in any one light group. So in this case, you can enable the Always Include Enviro Lights checkbox. Under the Layer Settings tab are a number of specialized parameters and render setting overrides, which can be applied to the current render layer. The Near and Far Clipping distances allow you to define a rendered image based on the distance from the camera by simply entering the values in meters for each of the parameters. To determine a position's actual distance from the camera, click on the View menu option on the menu bar and select 3D Preview Location to open up its floating window. Then, hover the mouse pointer over the location of interest in the 3D Preview while watching the Distance from Camera Display update on the 3D Preview Location window. Here are some rendered examples to illustrate the use of the clipping distances. When the checkbox for Atmos slash Cloud on Background is enabled, the atmosphere and clouds are rendered over the background, where background is considered to be any surface with an alpha value of zero. But when it is disabled, it allows for objects to be rendered against the black zero alpha background. The shading and lighting flags provide the render layer with control over the renderer's corresponding visibility and shadows parameters. In order for these effects to be enabled in the actual rendered image, their parameters must be enabled in both Render Node and the Render Layer. The Override GI Settings checkbox and GI Settings button provide the Render Layer with its own set of global illumination settings, in case you want to override the Render Node's global illumination settings. These GI settings work in exactly the same way as we've seen in the last two videos. The Render Layer's GI Settings node is located within its internal node network thus preserving and keeping separate the original render node's GI settings. The first three tabs give us the ability to control the content and how it looks in a rendered image. Under the Render Elements tab, we can choose to also save images that break down the final rendered image into the components that make it up. Enabling the checkbox next to the name of one of the rendered elements will instruct the renderer to save that particular render element as a separate image at the end of the render process for a given frame. The panel is divided into three sections corresponding to the type of information to be saved. By saving the render elements listed under the Extra Output Images section, they can be used to reconstruct the beauty pass or final rendered image in a third-party compositing package. The render elements listed under the Lighting section can be used to reconstruct the render elements in the Extra Output Images section. In other words, it gives you additional control by breaking out the render elements into even smaller units of data. For example, separating the direct lighting of a surface from the indirect lighting of the same surface. The render elements listed under the Data section provide other types of data that can be useful in the post-production compositing workflow such as the surface depth, which is also known as a Z-depth pass in other software packages. 
Let's briefly explore these sections and render elements. And we'll include a link in the description below to an in-depth tutorial on how to use these render elements in a post-production workflow. The RGB element is the same as the image saved via the output image file name parameter. This gives you the ability to save the final image in multiple file formats. For example, you could set the output image file name output file format to TIFF and set the render layer's output file format to EXR. The alpha element is the alpha channel for the image. Note that Terrigen does not save an alpha channel embedded in the final rendered image. So if you need an alpha channel, you must enable it here, which will instruct Terrigen to save the alpha channel as a separate image during the render process. The surface RGB element contains the visual information for the surfaces in the rendered image, such as the terrain and 3D objects. The atmosphere and clouds reduce the visibility of the surface in the rendered element, so that when all elements are added together during the compositing process, nothing is duplicated. The surface RGB element is one of the render elements that can be used to recreate the beauty pass, which we'll see in just a moment. The cloud RGB element contains the visual information for the clouds in the rendered image. In this render element, the atmosphere and surfaces block or reduce the visibility of the clouds. In other words, they act as holdouts in the clouds, so that all elements can be added together during the compositing process, without duplication or doubling up. If you have clouds in your shot, then the cloud RGB element is also needed to recreate the beauty pass. The Atmo RGB element contains the visual information for the atmosphere in the rendered image. In this rendered image, the surfaces and clouds act as holdouts in the atmosphere, so that it too can be added with those elements during the compositing process in order to create the beauty pass. In a compositing software package such as Nuke, Fusion, or After Effects, you can use an additive mode to combine the render elements we've just seen and perfectly recreate the beauty pass. This allows the compositor to fine tune and adjust each render element as necessary for the final shot. Each of these three render elements has a corresponding alpha channel render element and they can be combined additively as well. The render elements listed under the lighting section further break out the surfaces, lighting, and atmosphere render elements based on direct or indirect lighting. For example, the surface direct element contains all the surface information for the rendered image illuminated by the direct light sources in the image, such as the sunlight node, while the surface indirect element contains all the surface information for the rendered image illuminated by the indirect lighting in the image, in other words, the global illumination. If there are no luminous surfaces in the image, these two elements can be combined in an additive workflow to recreate the surface RGB element we previously looked at. The next four surface render elements in the lighting section further break down the surface direct lighting and indirect lighting elements by the surface's diffuse and specular components. These elements can be combined in an additive workflow to recreate the respective direct and indirect lighting elements, or to create diffuse and specular reflection elements for a materials-based approach to adjusting the image. The surface emission element contains the visual data for luminous surfaces within the rendered image. The cloud and atmosphere render elements are broken down into direct and indirect lighting elements in a similar manner. And the direct and indirect lighting elements can be combined in an additive workflow to recreate the respective atmosphere or cloud elements we previously looked at. The render elements listed under the data section provide a way to output a variety of other non-visual data types as rendered image sequences. The surface depth and cloud depth elements contain the data that represents the surface or cloud's distance from the camera. This is often referred to as a depth map or z-depth information. The surface motion and cloud motion elements contain the data that describes the apparent motion of objects within the image relative to the camera. The X vector and Y vector values that describe the motion are stored in the red and green channels of the image. Generally speaking, it's faster to render an image without realistic 3D motion blur. And by saving the 2D vector data as a render element, an approximation of the motion blur can be created in the compositing package. The surface positions and cloud position elements contain data that describes the position or coordinates of a point on a surface or cloud layer respectively in world space. 
world position is measured in meters and in Terrigen's coordinate space. Sometimes it may be necessary to reverse the Z channel and or swap Y and Z channels if you need to combine the render element with position passes rendered from other 3D software packages. The surface normal element contains data describing the 3D vector of a line perpendicular to the surface of an object or terrain in world space. The X normal values are mapped to the red channel, the Y normal values to the green channel, and the Z normal values to the blue channel. Like the position render elements, it may be necessary to reverse the Z normal value and or swap the Y normal and Z normal values if you need to combine the render element with the surface normal elements rendered from another 3D software package. The surface diffuse color element contains an object or terrain's diffuse color values before any lighting is applied. One way in which it can be used is to create masks based on the color values. Lastly, the sample rate render element is a special diagnostic image to help you identify where and how much sampling is taking place in the image. Now that we know how to set up Terrigen 4 Professional's render layers, the last step is to instruct Terrigen where to save the render elements. In the Renderer Sequence Output tab, the Extra Output Images parameter allows you to choose the location to save the images to. Click on the checkbox to enable the Extra Output Images. Then, click on the Save to Disk button to the right of the parameter and navigate to the location you wish to save the render elements to and enter a base file name. The file name should include the characters %04D and this pattern gets replaced with the frame number when each frame is rendered. Make sure to also include the word image type in uppercase letters as this pattern is replaced by the name of the render element so that each render element is saved to a different file. Recent versions of Terrigen will add these patterns automatically if you forget, but you need to remember to do this in older versions. Be sure to choose the file format to save the images, then close the dialog window by clicking on the Save button. The choice for which file format to use when saving render elements should be based on the render elements you wish to save. Some of the render elements listed under the Data section, like Surface Position, only provide the correct data to the compositing software package if saved as 32-bit float data, which means you'll need to choose the EXR file format and 32-bit depth option. If you're saving render elements in the TIFF file format, click on the TIFF options button and set the bits per channel and compression parameters to your desired values. However, many of the rendered elements can only be saved in the EXR format and will revert to using EXR regardless of which format you choose. If you want each rendered element to be organized in its own subfolder, click on the Create Subfolders checkbox. Terrigen will automatically create the subfolders. Lastly, set the render frame range by entering a value in the sequence first and sequence last, and set the sequence step accordingly. As you can see, Terrigen's render elements provide a way to save just the data you need to finesse the final rendered image, or reconstruct it completely from scratch if you need to. In the next video, we'll look at creating a specialized matte pass for the forest populations in the shot, which uses the red, green, and blue channels of their textures to isolate the leaves from the branches and trunk, and thereby allowing us to fine-tune the look of the forest during the compositing process. We hope you've enjoyed this video and learned something new. Thanks for watching. 